Hello, this is Evangelist Dr. Carl Hatch. In just a little while, I'll be giving my life story and bring, updating it. Years ago, I recorded at Anchorage Baptist Temple. That's where I'm at at this present time. When you start viewing this tape, this is my 20th year to be with Dr. Jerry Prevo, a great man of God. And I trust this will be a blessing to you if you know anybody got drinking or drug problems that uh, maybe through this uh, life story that it'll reach them. Or maybe you have someone that's uh, got away from the Lord, got back into drinking. Maybe a husband or wife or son or daughter, brother or sister. And when you watch this life story and hear it, uh, you can say there's still hope that what the Lord did for Brother Hatch, he can do for anybody. My prayer is that this life story will reach many lost people for Christ and encourage many Christians. Go with me now as I go into the new auditorium of the Anchorage Baptist Temple as I share my amazing grace life story. I pray it'll be a blessing to you. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears in the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day! singing for us again tonight. Amen? Amen. All right. Good. 
Now we want our ushers to come, please. We're going to give you an opportunity to worship the Lord with the giving of your tithes and offerings and also to give a special love offering to Brother Hatch. He's dependent upon the offerings received in meetings like this to go and preach the gospel in churches like this across this country. And I want to encourage you to give a generous offering to the Carl Hatch Ministries today to help with the expenses of his coming and being here and a special love offering to help him and his ministry. And, of course, he's dependent upon the faithfulness of giving of God's people because he's in full-time evangelism, doesn't have a church that supports him. He's dependent upon the contributions that are received in meetings like this. That's going to be a great day. Amen. No more pain, no more suffering. Some of our folks have been going through some real trials and tribulations, and some of our folks here are going to be going home to be with the Lord soon. We're glad there's a heaven they're going to. Amen. And we know we have that assurance that Dr. Hatch was talking about during the 10 o'clock hour. So I want to encourage you to get ready to give and especially to give a special offering today to Brother Carl Hatch for his coming, being with us, been here now for 20-some years, coming, preaching for us, and helping us here in the work at the Anchorage, Alaska. Let's bow our heads together, please, for a word of prayer as we prepare to worship the Lord today with the giving of our tithes and offerings. Father, thank you again for your marvelous love. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us that we might have life, eternal life with you, that we might have the hope of heaven, that we might have the hope of a better day coming, a better place to go to where there's no more pain, no more suffering, no more death. We pray your blessings be upon this service today and minister to each of the hearts of the people who are here in this auditorium, those who are watching by television. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you today as you give. Listen to our quartet as they sing for us. When this world feels like a desert, a dry and barren land, it seems there is no one to care or lend a helping hand to a brother or a sister whose life is filled with pain. back up. This morning, I've asked Dr. Hatch to give his life story. How many of you have never heard it before? Raise your hand, would you please? A number of you haven't. And of course, the turnover here we have at the Anchorage Baptist Temple, a lot of new folks coming 
and being here, Dr. Hatch has been coming, preaching here at the Anchorage Baptist Temple now for over 20 years, helping us to win souls here in Anchorage, Alaska. His life story has given hope to many people who thought God maybe was, would not even love them or care for them because of their problems, their sins, and how far they'd sunk down in this old world. But Dr. Hatch had sunk all the way down, and God reached down by his marvelous grace and saved his life. I want him to come today and tell you how God saved him. Will you welcome Dr. Carl Hatch back to the Anchorage Baptist Temple today. Dr. Hatch. Well, it's good to be back with my friend, Dr. Prevo. I recorded my life story here years, six years ago, and I wanted to update the, not my life story, but they got much, even much better equipment than they had then. I love Anchorage Baptist Temple, and I love Dr. Jerry Prevo. He's meant a lot to my life down through the years, and as this goes across America and into foreign countries, as we're recording it today, I wanted Dr. Prevo to introduce me because he's my friend and I'm his friend. It's the greatest thing to be said about anybody. Thank you for being so kind to me. I want to read my life story out of the Bible. And I might say today, if while you're turning to the book of Psalms, Psalms 142 and then in Psalms 40, I want to say today that I'm what I am by the grace of God. You may be here this morning and never live the life that I lived, but it takes as much grace to save the good as it does the bad. Doesn't make any difference. And my prayer is that it'll be used to reach your friends and your loved ones, that they'll come to know the Lord through my life story and what I was and what I am. I'm ashamed of my past. But I'm not ashamed of my present. I try to live the life today that every little boy or girl could say I'd like to be like Brother Hatch. But I am ashamed of my past. Even though it's under the blood, never to be remembered against me anymore. That he took my sins as far as the east as to the west. He said that because there's an end to north and south. But there's not an end to east and west. And I'm glad that he said that. Psalms 142, I looked on my right hand in verse 4. Beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me, no man cared for my soul. I cried unto thee, O Lord, I said, art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry, for I'm brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they're stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. Then if you'll turn to Psalms 40, I'm glad if everybody turns their back on you that Jesus loves you and he cares for you. I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock. And that rock is the Lord Jesus and established my goings and he had put a new song in my mouth. That song is amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the rich like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Blind, but now I see. He had put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust. I believe the Lord began speaking to me at an early age. I believe as a 13-year-old boy living in a small town in Arkansas that God spoke to me the first time. My brother was running a pool hall and asked if I'd work in the place and clean it up and rack the balls, and I told him I would. At the age of 13, I began to get in the wrong environment, see and hear the wrong things, and every day there was a man would take alcohol and coke and mix it together. Give it to me as a 13-year-old boy. Every day he would gradually take part of the coke out. By the time I'd reached the age of 15, I was a confirmed alcoholic at 15 years of age. Sin already had a grip on my life as a teenage boy. The thing that breaks my heart, that never a, never a Sunday school bus worker ever offered to pick me up. Nobody ever talked to me. No, no Sunday school teacher 
because they didn't, I didn't go to Sunday school. See, it already had a grip on my life. I remember it was always yesterday in the wee hour of the morning, and they had a room in the back of the pool hall where they shot dice and played cards, and my brother said, son, you need to go check the fire. Big old pot belly coal stove, and I went over and opened the door, and there was no blaze, and there was just some coal. I threw some coal in and fuel all on top and closed the door, not realizing what I was doing. A little while later, he said, son, you need to go check the fire. By this time, pressure had built up in the stove. When I opened the door, it blew up in my face. My clothes were caught on fire. My face was burnt. We lived 18 miles from the nearest doctor hospital, a little small country town. At that time, the population was probably about 200 or less, and, and uh, 18 miles to the nearest doctor hospital. And I remember it as though it was just lying on the couch, and my brother was standing foot of the couch crying. and said, if Carl goes blind, it's because of me. But I remember my mama kneeling down at the head of the couch and laying her hand on my burnt body. And I heard my mama praying, if it be the Lord's will, to let my baby live and let him see again. And I believe I'm standing here today because of the grace of God. And I want you to know today that I believe in divine healing. I do not believe in man healing, but I believe in divine healing. I do not believe in a healer, but I believe in the healer, if it be his will. I had reached the age of 15, and Eugene, a friend of mine, I, I had fully recovered, my body had fully recovered, and he said, let's go in the army. We went and forged our parents' name, went in the army. Now, when I got saved, I had to go to public school and Bible school at the same time. I couldn't read. I'd go to get a job, I'd stand and have somebody fill out my papers, and I'd stand there and make my elbow move. And as soon as they get through, I'd sign my name. And that's how I got through life, by having other people fill out my papers and I could sign my name. We forged our parents' name, went in the Army. Was only in a short time, got caught up with and got kicked out. The short time I was in for no reason at all, I developed in my heart a hatred for this book. I didn't believe in God. I didn't believe in people like you. I thought you were a bunch of phonies. I didn't believe in Christianity. In the short time I was in, I'd managed to get on drugs. And so I, I came back to the little town that I'm originally from, from. The man giving me the alcohol and drugs were not there anymore. But I had the alcohol in my system and I had to have it. So I began breaking and entering stores and I picked up my first record at 16. 16, 17, and 18. I'd go in the back alleys and look in garbage cans. I'd drink anything that was liquid. Didn't make any difference to me, I would drink it. I'd come home in the wee hour of the morning, drunk up and drugged up, and we were poor people. I'm not exaggerating, we were poor people. The house that we were renting was $6 a month, and, and the president of the bank owned the house, and I worked in the bank and made our house rent $6 a month. They raised our rent to $8 a month, they raised me to $8 a month, and Papa managed to raise one hog a year. It was a lot cheaper to slop one hog a year than it was to buy meat. We had a house here and a porch and a smokehouse here. There were six children in the family. We sat on a homemade bench, four of us, and eat. As soon as we get through eating, we'd take that bench out in the smokehouse and put it underneath the table where Papa had salted the meat down, about five foot off the floor. When I'd leave home, my mama would head into the smokehouse, get on her knees and beg God to save me. I'd come home in the wee hour of the morning, drunk up and drugged up, and I'd step up on the porch and I could hear my mama in the smokehouse praying for me. And I went to the door and had a crack in the door about like that, and I stood there and made fun of my mama. I called her a religious nut. I called her a fanatic. I went as far as to go in the smokehouse and tell her to get off her knees. No such a thing as a God. And my mama looked up at me and the tears running down her face. And she said, I'll never quit praying. Amen. And I want to say to you mamas, don't quit praying. There's still hope. There's still hope for your son or daughters. Well, don't quit praying. Eugene started flying on the GI Bill. Wasn't long he got his solo license and I was over at his girlfriend's house and I saw that plane circling around him. He and I both were smart alecks, and 
he would come down like that and pull it up and around like this. And I said, I believe that's Eugene. And she said, that is Eugene. And he started coming down all the other time. And he pulled it out. And I began screaming and hollering. I said, I don't, I don't believe he's going to pull it out. I, I believe he's going to crash. And she began screaming and hollering. And she said, uh, he's going to crash. He's going to crash. And Eugene crashed just forward from here to the outside of the building. And the plane went up in flames. But it didn't kill Eugene, but he was pinned in the plane and couldn't get out. And while the plane was burning, and he pushed a little window back. And he hollered, Carl, get me out of the plane. Get me out of the plane. And excuse the expression, I said, I said, and go to hell. He said, why did you say that? Because I was a no good rotten sinner, that's why. If there ever was a man deserved going to hell, you're looking at him. But all because of the grace of God, I don't have to go. And I stood there and watched Eugene burn before my eyes when maybe I could have saved his life. I went to the funeral home to see him. And they said he's not ready for the burial. We're not allowed to show him. I lied to him. I said, I'm his brother. I got to see him. We're not allowed to show him he's not ready for the barrel. And if you did, you'd regret it for the rest of your life. I started out, I got a glimpse of Eugene. I could hear, I could see him on the plane with a lid just like he was in the plane. And I, I could hear that scream over and over again. I could hear me repeating the same sentence. I didn't believe in prayer. I didn't believe in Christianity. But I got over the corner of the funeral home and I began to cry. And I said, if there be a God, don't let me die like Eugene died. And when I started out of the funeral home, I said, if God had burned a teenage boy, I don't want to ever know God. I don't want to ever know God. And the bitterness increased in my life. And I kept getting worse and worse day by day. And, and finally, the Korean War broke out. I was drafted back in through the reserve. I went to Camp Chaffee, Arkansas, and I met who's now my wife. We began to correspond by phone and her uncle was, was a top officer there, and back then you didn't have to take a test to get a stripe. If they liked you, they'd just put them on you. So I made first sergeant. I had three up and three under, and I made first sergeant. And I had never, it wasn't long I was transferred to Fort Lewis, Washington, second division. I had never feared death before in my life. I thought everybody dies alike, everybody rots alike. I didn't think some went to hell and some went to heaven. I was not afraid to die. I had, I had never feared death. Just because you're not afraid to die does not mean you're ready to meet God. I was not afraid to die. But if there ever was a man headed for hell, I was headed for hell. But I didn't fear death. For the first time, I got to thinking, what if I got on shipping orders and didn't come back? Wasn't long, got on shipping orders. My whole outfit was blowed to bits. Brother Jack Baskin, my dear friend, who's responsible for me coming to this church back many years ago. Outfit came up to relieve us, no one there to relieve. And I came back home as a hero. Instead of helping me, it hurt me. Instead of, I, got my, I got my drugs free, I got my alcohol free, I got everything free. So instead of helping me, it hurt me. I got so bad, excuse the expression, I got so bad when I would spit, there'd be blood come out of my body. When I accepted the Lord as my savior, I weighed less than 90 pounds. I was guessed to be 70 years of age. I have a picture in my billfold. You're welcome to see it. It's an Army Reserve card. You can't forge those. And you can see what I looked like before I was saved. Famous, you can see it in my book of my life story. You can see uh, how small I was even there. Uh, you can see that I weighed less than 90 pounds when I received the Lord as my Savior. Hair was back here off. In my eyes, you could see the cheekbones of my face. Sin had a grip on my life. And I came back home, and I got so bad, I thought of marriage. I called who's now my wife and asked her if she'd marry me, said she would. I went back to where she lived in, in Rogers, Arkansas. When I got there, her father checked on me and found out I'd been in jail different places and had a record. And he said, you're marrying a no good drunken bum. You're marrying a drug addict good for nothing. And he was telling the truth. When I got there, she said, I can't marry you. I said, listen, I can quit. I, I can quit. I can, I can drink or not drink. I can pop the pills on it. 
These people tell me they can drink or not drink, then don't drink. A hog won't drink it. If you suck on a bottle, I put you in the category of a hog. He said, I don't like that. I'm making me I've done said and I'm going to take it back. I don't know of any homes ever been put together through alcohol, but I can name you a lot of them been divided to it. I'm against the label. I convinced her I could quit. We got married, got a couple to stand with us, and we got married, took my wife back to the little town that I'm originally from. We'd only been married a short time. My wife was living in fear. She'd sleep with one eye open, one ear open, because of the line of conversation I was holding. She's afraid to go to sleep at night. Hadn't, ever, hadn't been married long. I tried to take her life for the first time and set up for that. And finally, I told her, I said, listen, why don't we move? Why, why don't we go to the big city? Why don't we go where nobody knows me? I can get a brand new start. Let's go where the police don't know me. And we packed up what we had wasn't much and moved to Flint, Michigan. I didn't know a soul in Flint, Michigan, but I want you to know all I was doing was running from my sin. Anywhere you go, anywhere you go, your sin will be there. That's all I was doing was running. We got to Flynn. I got an apartment. Didn't have it long. Got kicked out. Got another apartment and lose it. Another apartment and lose it. I'd get a job and lose it. Job and lose it. Apartment and lose it. Job and lose it. Finally, I got a job in the Buick factory making good money. But every dime I made was spent on sin. My wife worked at AC Spark Plugs, and for years, my wife did not see a paycheck. She didn't know what I made. The money I made was used to spend on drugs and alcohol and other things that shouldn't spend it on. The money she made was for us to eat. And we got, got so bad, I couldn't even get an apartment in a city as large as Flint, Michigan. I could not get an apartment. Uh, my wife and I had no place, no place to go. And we got kicked out. We had four bags of odds and ends and uh, two bus stations. been one night and one, one the other, back and forth. And then I'd take my wife to an all-night joint. I'd sit over here in the corner. I worked on the transmission, on the passing gears. By 10 o'clock in the morning, I was through. I could sit down, do whatever I wanted to do. I'd take my wife to an all-night joint, sit there and drink all night. And the next morning, my wife would sit and then sleep in a straight back chair. And finally, one of the bus stations realized it's been a lot of time. They kicked us out. They called the other bus station. They kicked us out. They called the all-night joint, and they kicked us out. And my wife and I began to beat the streets. My wife was crying, and she said, we don't, have, we don't have any place to sleep tonight. I said, I'll find somewhere for us. Broke into Salvation Army and got some Army blankets and began to make our way around through the back alleys and found some junk cars, and we'll sleep there tonight. Spent two nights and got out that morning. She's crying. And she said, is this all I have to live for? And I said, this is it. She said, I'm going to file for divorce. I said, if you do, I'll kill you. She said, I'd rather be dead. I'd rather be dead. Just live in hell. I said, listen, I can quit. I can straighten up. I'm not against AA, but AA didn't deliver me. Jesus Christ did. He's the answer to alcohol. He's the answer to drugs. He's the answer to every problem in your life. My wife, she was living in fear. I said, listen, I can quit. She said, I'm on five with a divorce. Give me six months. I'll give you six months. We're getting a divorce. I believe the first miracle took place in my life. Went to household finance. I borrowed $500 without a reference. That's a miracle. Amen. I went over on James Street. I bought a little one-bedroom shack. And I'm not exaggerating. It wasn't fit to put a dog in. And I moved my wife into that little shack. You can see the house in my life story book that's out on the table. And that little old house, you can see the house I was saved in. That, you can set that house in my den. I don't have that big a home in Dallas. But you can actually set that house in my den. This had room to put a bed in there and a mirror on the wall and moved in there. And I'm not exaggerating. It, was, it wasn't fit to put a dog in. The floors are like this. The walls like that. And I, I told her, I said, I'll decorate the place for you. I took some coffee tables. I made some out of some orange box and, and apple boxes and made her some end tables and coffee tables. And I'm going to decorate the place for you. 
I went to town, I got a step ladder, a gallon of paint, and a theft of alcohol. I came back home and I was up on the ladder rolling that paint on, drinking and cursing God. I had the filthiest mouth a man could have. I had the alcohol here and the paint here, and I was rolling the paint on, drinking and cursing God. And when somebody knocked on my door, I said, come here. And the man came in and said, I'm your neighbor. I want to welcome you to the community. I said, thank you. Good to have you as my neighbor. I said, thank you. I want to help you decorate the place. Well, I said, get up here. I cut down off the ladder. I'm spreading newspapers down here, and I noticed him getting up the ladder. I noticed he had a, a one, one leg or one foot. He couldn't walk and couldn't bend it. And I, I, I'm down here drinking, cursing God, and he had a hard time getting up the ladder. And he said, well, it's good to have you as my neighbor. I said, thank you. He said, I'm a Baptist preacher. <laughs> Man, I said, I said, you're what? He said, I'm a Baptist preacher. I said, come down off that ladder. He came down off that ladder. I said, you see that door? I said, you hit it. And don't you ever put your foot on my property again. If you do, I'll kill you. And he knew I'd kill him. He came down off that ladder, hopping on one foot. I thought he'd never get out of my living room. And I want to tell you something, folks. He wasn't crying. He was sobbing. He was literally sobbing. Tears running down his face like two water fountains dripping from his chin. When he walked out that door, he said one thing that literally tore me in a million pieces. He turned around, he said, Carl, I want you to know I love you. Dr. Prevo is like somebody. It was like somebody took a knife and cut my heart out and laid it on the table. And I thought, how could he love me? I mean, I'm a drunk, I'm a nothing. I'm a has-been. How hell could he love me? I knew my wife, my mama loved me, but how, how could he love me? And every day, in fact, the minutes, I just spoke at a big meeting here a few, a few weeks ago, thousands of people, like, I don't know, probably two, three, four thousand people there, preachers, and he was there. And he stood, and I didn't even know he was there. His mind's going, he's standing out here and he stood and said, Carl, I still love you. And it shook that place up. Every day when I'd pull my driveway, he'd pull in his. Never come home, I'd probably be standing right at the edge of it. And he'd say, hello, Carl, I love you. I'm praying for you. And I'd say, shut up. <laughs> God was working on me, man. And every day, Dr. Mark, every day he pulled my driveway and I'd pull in mine. If, 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 if we were 15 minutes late, he'd be 15 minutes late. <laughs> if I was 20 minutes early, he'd be 20 minutes early. I sometimes wonder if he's parked up the road looking for us, but I don't believe he was. I believe God was leading that preacher. And every day I got sworn a conviction. And every Thursday was their prayer meeting now, and he wasn't the pastor, just a member there. But every Thursday, he'd invite my wife and I to church, and I got sick of it. And I got so in a conviction, but I didn't know it was conviction. I told my wife, I said, this is Thursday night. Meet me at the hamburger place. I'd meet my wife at the hamburger place, and we'd stay there two or three hours till I knew he's going to church. And after three weeks, I called her, and I said, well, he's forgot it now. I'm coming home. I pulled in the driveway and he said, Carl, where have you been? I said, man, you don't ever give up, do you? Get off of my back. But he kept coming back with love. And the Bible says love never fails. And I got so in a conviction, I told the men in the shop, I'm going to end it all. I went and bought as much as I could buy of alcohol. I owed over a $300 liquor bill when I got saved. Over a $300 liquor bill. I bought all I could carry. I'd always take a fifth of alcohol, a pack of Tom peanuts and my dinner pail. By 10 o'clock in the morning, the alcohol and peanuts would be gone. 
And so I'd, I'd been drinking all day. I stopped and bought all I could carry. I walked in the back door. I sat down on the couch drinking and cursing God. And my wife came in and squatted down in front of me and said, aren't you going to ever quit? Aren't you going to ever quit? Don't you know our home is on the rocks? Didn't that mean anything to you? I said, no, I'm going to die a drunkard. I don't know what my wife said, but I hit my wife, and she fell backwards. I took a fifth of alcohol and poured it all over her body and poured it in her mouth, and she collapsed. I said, well, I've killed her. I better run. I've killed her. I went out on the front porch, and I stepped down on one step, and I stepped down on another step. When that one-legged preacher lifted his hand one more time and said, Carl, I want you to know I love you. Well, I was caught. I couldn't run. I stepped back up on the porch. And I heard my wife groaning. And I said, she's alive. And I hollered, preacher, preacher, come here. I want to tell you tough guys something this morning. When you get in trouble, you'll call God's man. I like to deal with these tough guys. I'd rather deal with them as Sunday school boys. You just like I was, you a lot of bark and no bite. Amen. Got over crazy could and took my wife and took care of her. He said, well, did you change any? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. He started coming over my property. I, I even started respecting him. My wife and I'd get out of the car and I'd say, here he comes. Here he comes. He'd come over and talk to us and I'd say a bad word. And I'd say, I'm, 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 I, 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 I'm sorry, Reverend. I didn't mean it, Reverend. Will you, will you forgive me, Reverend? I didn't mean to say it, Reverend. And my wife and I got out of the car. I had a cigarette in my hand and I saw him coming. I said, here he comes. And I'm standing there and he walked up and I held that cigarette behind me. Smoke come over my shoulder. I'd go. <laughs> three, days, three days ago, I wanted to kill him. I was tough, wasn't it? Three days ago, I wanted to kill him. Now I didn't want him to see that smoke over my shoulder. That's tough, isn't it? I mean, I was tough. And finally, on Thursday, we pulled in the driveway. He said, Carl, won't you and Ruby go to church with us? I said, no. Every Thursday, every Thursday, and finally, a man in the shop made me a bet he could outdrink me. And I called the bet. We started on North Saginaw and headed south, back and forth, back and forth. Got down to the last bar, and this has been, now there's quite a few months in between these incidents, and I'm telling you because of time today, but there's quite a few months in between these incidents that I'm telling you about now. And so I, I, I call the bet. We start on North Saint on heading south, going back and forth to each bar. We got down to the last bar sometime in the wee hour of the morning. And all I remember is going to the telephone. I called my wife. And she picked up the receiver. And I said, I'm coming home to take your life. And my wife began screaming and hollering, Why? 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 I haven't done anything. I said, I've done everything but murder, and I want to commit murder. And all I remember is taking a beer bottle and going over to the bar and breaking it. And walked out the door to go across the street two blocks to cut my wife's throat. And the big snow was on the ground. Snow was falling. And I stepped in between two wrecked cars parked in front of that bar. And I stepped down off the curb. My feet slipped out from under me. Went back. My head hit the curb, knocked me out. And I lay there all night. Next day, he said, if it'd take me to business place, I'd die in seconds. But all I remember, lying on the table, and heard the hospital, I heard one doctor say to another, this young man will never live. Unless we get the blood circulating in his body, he's just about froze. And lying on that table, I made God a promise. I said, Lord, if you let me live, I'll live for you. After two weeks, I got out, come home. You know who met me in the ambulance when they opened the back door? You know who was there? That preacher. And he said, Carl, we've been praying for you. 
I said, Reverend, get off of my back. I just got out of the hospital. It's like some of you when I thought I was going to die. I promised God everything. When I found out I was going to live, I forgot all about it. Just like some of you this morning. You promised God everything when trouble hits. When everything's going well, you forget all about it. And then finally, he came over on Thursday night. My wife and I got out of the car. He said, Carl, I'm going to ask you and Ruby one more time to go to church. And this is it. I said, now the reverend's giving up on me. I said, we can't go to church. He said, why not? I said, it'll fall in. Well, he said, if it does, we'll fix it. He had the answer for everything I said. And I said, you, you want to go to church? And she said, let's go to church. I said, Reverend, we're going to church. Now, you're going to have to realize, some, many of you met my wife. She was here a few years ago with me. My wife is not an emotional person. I am. I can't help it. When the quartet sings or Brother Light sings, it tears my heart. I can't help it. If you don't like it, pray for me. If you do, praise God. But I got to be me. Amen. But I, you're not saved through emotions. You're saved by grace through faith. Now, my wife, I don't think I've, and, I, and I don't, I'm not being critical, but I don't think I've seen her cry uh, over anything like a song or anything in maybe a half a dozen times. But I am an emotional person. When I said we're going to church, my wife jumped up and she said, Thank God, thank God, my husband's going to church. She shouted before she ever got saved. Some of you never shouted since you've been saved. I said, well, wait a minute, I'll give you some orders. He said, won't you ride with us? I had an old 47 Kaiser. Wouldn't hardly run. I said, okay, we'll ride with you. Well, I had, had to wire the door on and everything. I said, wait a minute, I want to give you some orders. Okay. I'm going to sit on the back row. Okay. When they start that, I didn't know what you call it. He said, invitation? Yeah. I don't want somebody to come back and get in a hole in my arm and they get a handful of knuckles. He said, won't anybody bother you? We got there that night. My wife stayed out in the vestibule with that preacher and his wife shaking hands. And I went and sat on the back row getting mad by the minute. And finally she came in and sat down. I said, you finally made it. And she said, yeah. And that preacher, before he ever preached, he tore me from limb to limb. I was the only person there that night. There was not another person in the building. Now, there's a lot of them there. He just didn't see them. He didn't look over here. He didn't look over here. Uh, he looked right back there and hit me right here. And he began to come down on me. And he said, some of these, and I, he, I mean, he would have laid me out. Some of these sorry, rotten, no good husbands that go out and get drunk and beat your wife. God have mercy on you, boy. I said, see, that's why you want me here. She said, I didn't tell him anything. Well, I said, he's laying me out. <laughs> Did you ever go to church when you knew somebody told the preacher all about you? <laughs> and then he got on Isaiah 118. And Brother Haynes, I thought he'd never get off of it. He said, come now, come now. And then he said, let it read together. Let us read together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they should be white as snow. Though they be red, like crimson, they be wool. I'd get behind somebody's like electric finger just come around like that and hit me. <laughs> and I said, is he talking about me? You mean to tell me I can be made white as snow? I can't buy that. And I just stood up and said, I can't buy that. And sat back down. But I said my piece. And I said, if he ever says amen, I'm getting out of here. These are not my kind of people. I know how you feel this morning. I mean, I was looking more forward to getting out of church than I was in any jailhouse or penitentiary. I know how you feel this morning. You can't hardly wait till I get done. But if your law's headed for hell, you'll backslide it. But you may as well hang in there, honey. I'm going to be here just a minute. Amen. And when he said amen, I told my wife, and I said, I'll meet you in the car. 
I told my wife and that preacher and his wife, I'll meet you in the car. I went out to the car. He locked one door. I went and he locked another door. He locked all four doors. I, it was a cold night. I couldn't get in the car. I walked around and around and around, and he came. He, hey, Carl, come here. Forget it. I want you to meet the pastor. I don't want to meet the pastor. We either freeze to death or meet him. I went in and met him. I said, let's get out of here, man. Got home, pulled in the driveway. Don't you and Ruby go in for coffee? You think I'm stupid? You're going to hit me that religion bit again, and I'm sick of it. He said, I won't bother you. You want to go in? She said, let's go in. We went in. His wife went in to fix coffee. I'm sitting here, my wife's sitting here, and the preacher's sitting here. He got talking to my wife about being saved, being saved, being saved, being saved, being saved, being saved. But he wasn't talking to me. <laughs> That's good wisdom. But I was sitting right there, and I couldn't turn him off. You can't turn God off. You may turn him down, but you can't turn him off. And my wife said, we're getting a divorce, and hey, I'd like to, I'd like to be a Christian. And he looked over to me, and I was a smart aleck, and he said, what about you, Carl? And I said, why don't you give her enough of both of us? You won't have to fool me. He said, <laughs> he said I wish I could. I really wish I could. But it's a personal matter between you and the Lord. And I was a smart aleck. I said, well, I'll give it a whirl. I'll give it a whirl. We got on our knees. And I really believe, I believe God gives that preacher credit for leading me to the Lord, even though, because I was raised in a movement where you say law, say law, say law. And so anyway, we got on our knees. My wife made a heart, I made a head. Got home, and my wife threw her arm around and said, thank God her home's going to be spared. I went to the refrigerator and got a bottle. I came back in, sitting down, drinking and cursing God. And she came in, she said, I thought you got saved. I, I, I thought you got saved. I said, no, he thinks I did. And if you tell him any day, I'll kill you. And I want to tell you here this morning that you may fool your husband, your wife, your son, your daughter, and your mother and your father and the preacher, but you will not fool God. She went all through the house crying and praying. And I'm sitting there looking at that little old bedroom. And she came in and squatted down in front of me weeping. said, why don't you get saved? Why don't you get saved? And I mean, she was sobbing her heart, and I'd move my head, and it seemed like her head would move. It wasn't moving. It was just tears of passion tearing me up. And I looked down, I said, listen, I need help. I need help. Please, go in the bathroom and pray for me. I need help. I've gone all the way to the bottom. I can't go any other way but up. Pray for me. And I'm sitting there looking at that little old bedroom. And I had such a filthy mouth. I wanted to pray, but I was afraid. I just a dumb hillbilly. I didn't know how to pray. And I heard her there praying, Lord, save my husband. If it means taking my life, and then take my life. I knew she had something I didn't have. Boy, I tell you, I got so in a conviction. I, it seemed like I'd go to get up and something pull me down. Go to get up and something pull me down. I was afraid to go in because I didn't know how to talk. I didn't know how to talk because my mouth was so filthy. And I, I seemed like I'd get up and something pull me down. And the man seemed like somebody picked me up with the seat of the britches and threw me in there. And I got down on my knees. And I didn't even know how to pray. But I just looked up and I said, Lord, Lord, if you just say this old boy, I would appreciate it. I came out of there with victory in my soul. I knew I'd saved from something and to something and from hell to heaven and from Satan to the Son of God. And I've been excited about it ever since. You didn't have to ground me, buddy, and say, did you mean it? When you get what I got, bless God, you'll know it. You say, well, did you get a feeling? Yeah! Still got that feeling. But the feeling didn't save me. That's the results of it. Amen. Boy, I met her in the living room, hair down their face, and I didn't know how to turn me anything. I said, honey, I got it. I got it. <laughs> I got it, honey. I got religion. I said, call the lawyers and cancel that divorce. I got religion. Boy, I tell you, I was so happy. I put five coffee cups from my dinner pail. I stole out of Buick. Instead of taking the alcohol, I put the five coffee cups in there and started in that morning. The guards, hey, what do you, you got in your dinner pail? Got some cups. 
Open it. What are you doing with those? I got, I got religion this morning about 4 o'clock, and I really feel good, and I stole these out of Buick, and I'm bringing them back. You what? I said, I, I got religion this morning about 4 o'clock, and I really feel good, and I stole these out of Buick, and I'm bringing them back. He scratched his head. He said, good, man. You got that kind of religion? He said, keep them cups. <laughs> when, you, when, you, when you get saved, you'll get honest with God in that. Amen. When you get saved, you may even start tithing. Let me say it again. When you get saved, you may even start tithing. You have been watching the services of the Anchorage Baptist Temple. If your need is for salvation, we encourage you to receive Jesus Christ by asking Him into your life right now. If you have a problem, approach God with that problem. He will help. And if you need a church home, we invite you to the Anchorage Baptist Temple where you'll always find a friendly welcome.